And then from all the ones that you've talked a little bit about, I see a pattern where um, at this intersection of art, tech, and science, you have um, projects that where the art contributes to the science and the science contributes to the art. So are what are like, I guess, hallmarks of this type of collaboration? And are there certain points that make it an art science collaboration or art tech collaboration um, under this? Mm, that's an interesting question. Historically, one of the markers that stands out to me was actually the um, uh, focus point of my supervisor, um, my supervisor's focus, which was on George Kippesh, who was the first artist in residence at MIT. And this was kind of one of the first instances that you had a clear um, name for it. it was, he was there as an artist in residence to look at the technology, and he would do amazing close-up photography um, and um, would publish it. It would just be fascinating because he would turn these very functional things um, into very beautiful works. And that was an um, interesting relationship that MIT still has to this day. I mean, you know, MIT has been the forerunner on things like wearable technology, which does come from people, artists who can work with textiles, um, melding with um, technological innovation. So that's definitely one that stays out, sticks out in my mind. Um, as well as a lot of architectural theory, which I'm less familiar with, but I know that um, the design of architecture, which does, in its essence, straddle um, the sciences and the arts, the artistic um, design of a building with the science required to make sure that it's going to stand up, <laughs> is just at that point. Um, and I've, I, I myself am not a specialist in architecture, but I know many friends who will talk for days about it. Most recently, I think the buzzwords around this would be neuroscience and neuroaesthetics as one of them. Um, speaking more about the visual arts, music has been, uh, has been more intertwined, I feel, with science and mathematics specifically for longer, as I've mentioned with um, Darby's example. But um, with the visual arts and neuroscience, it seems like this culmination of questions about aesthetics. Um, the neuroscientist at one point said, and I think it starts with about Samir Zeki in 1990, I think he published one of the works. Probably goes a bit further back, but around 1990, I'd say, is when it became like buzzworthy for the first time. Um, and he talks about what if we can find in the, our brain where it pings and lights up when we look at something beautiful. And it... it were born this, you know, it started this theory of um, neuroaesthetics where they're looking for it. Okay, can we find it? And now there are a lot of issues with it on the scientist side, on the artist side. There's still no conclusion, but what it did was it opened the floodgates to all these questions um, and all these possibilities. It's a marker, I think, where neuroscience, which is what is believed by many as the um, truth-telling kind of science you know it tells us what connections happen in our brain and people don't really doubt the science when they hear oh it's a neuroscientific explanation um being able to reduce art to an explanation okay we know what's good and what's bad um or rather what they believe is beautiful however as we know with artists you know starting as back as Marcel Duchamp art is not always supposed to be beautiful it can provoke um, it can be ugly. Um, they said, you know, we, we had artists, especially the postmodernists, saying, well, art should be about truth and the human condition, and that's not always pretty. So neuroaesthetics does have its own issues, um, and I am very interested to see, like, where it goes in the future. But out of that came neuroart. Um, and neuroart is another field where you actually just take images of the brain and show them as artistic works um, because often uh, a gel, um, a particular gel, the name's escaping me, it's like silver, is used, you can color them to track what's happening in the brain. That's usually how the scans work. So you have this kind of trace um, of what's lighting up in your brain. And there have been um, great investigations and I think, I forget, I think it's the Welcome Trust, I have to double check, but there um, is an annual contest for um, brain images and they're seen as artworks. So you do have this kind of obsession with the brain aesthetics and the visual arts that all come together. And I think it's a modern day hallmark um, 
ignoring, which I tend to, you know, like Leonardo da Vinci, which a lot of people think, you know, well, da Vinci was the epitome of art and science. And in many ways he was, but in his time, uh, that was seen as um, his craft. It was his skill. And um, there were others, maybe not as prolific, but that also engaged in those activities in recording the natural world. So when I look at the modern world, we're fighting barriers or trying to either um, find the science behind art or art used in science. Those are those hallmarks that stick with me in my mind. And I say, oh my God, someone is just trying tooth and nail to get to something. And I think they're onto it. I think that we won't find out maybe, you know, what pings in our brain when we look at art. But I do think that using the technologies like those used by neuroscience and having neuro um, scientists explain visual perception to artists and artists vice versa has great opportunities. Do you think in your art that there is the space for scientists and artists to learn um, each other's perception and for that to like influence their work? I think so. And one of the um, one of the best examples I found of that was working with the Convergence Initiative, because we we posed that question exactly, and we we did it. So uh, when I say we did it, we decided to instead of theorizing about it, we brought artists and neuroscientists together. And so in the project, which started in 2016 by um, Dr. Christian Seltzer, who's uh, a neuroscientist and um, he does um, graphic art and stained glass work. He um, is based at McGill, and he um, brought me on, and we decided to. We had a group of artists from Concordia and neuroscientists from McGill, and they, before we even started their collaborative project, they did a five-minute talk series. Each of them, so the scientists had to boil down their um, work into five minutes to explain to the artists, and the artists likewise had to boil down what they were working on to the scientists. And together, afterwards, they would kind of pair up based on their common interests and create something entirely new. And it was, it it happened for the first time in 2016, which I was involved in, and it's been going on every year since, even after I've moved away. Um, Christian has a great team of volunteers with him, um, and the artists and scientists seem to want it. That's the part that I find so interesting. Um, I spent time interviewing them as the project happened in 2016. And I remember talking to one neuroscientist in particular, um, who he'd been working on, um, on scientific experiments that, that required him to dissect mice and the brain of mice. And he tells me that, um, you know, he's a vegetarian. He says he believes in animal rights and he doesn't, um, believe in eating meat because it makes my work so important because every time I sacrifice an animal, it's for a cause. It's for, you know, a search for, you know, X, Y, or Z. And, um, he talks about how he didn't have an, an outlet to, to express that because, um, it's just so bottled up because it's a, you know, you get it passed by an ethics committee, an ethics board, it's rationalized, and then you go ahead with it. And it was interesting talking to him because you could see all of this, um, there's stuff around the science that I don't think we always talk about. I think that's where art has its place. And that kind of goes into um, a theory that was presented by Bruno Latour called actor network theory, which it looks at all of the connections, what he calls actants, around a scientific discovery or um, the act of employing a scientific method um, to find a scientific discovery. And it's in that that I, I, you know, investigate, that I probe, because I think the artists also know to probe there. I think that is where the arts come in and complete a picture, in a sense, um, fill in some gaps. They make it human, because science is human. I don't think it is stats on a paper. I think it really is human. <laughs> That's really well said. That's it for this episode of Beyond Codes and Aesthetics. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to your podcasts. Also, please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. It will help other listeners discover what we're doing. Beyond Codes and Aesthetics is produced by Kohei and Translations on Himalaya Podcasts by Will Jung. Take care and see you next time.